So let's get on with the speakers. Um, most of you probably know this man. He is a psychologist, a retired psychologist. Has written many books, um, not just the ones on the racks, but what? No, I go, well, let's give you a proper intro introduction. Um, he's, he's spoke at the toolbox <laughs> just about every single year that I was there. Probably every single year. Were you at every single one of them? Okay, so you're at every single. Take some compliments here for a second. Um, the great thing about Lauren is he puts in historical context all these things, these beliefs that are still active today and gives us really this super broad and deep understanding of uh, people and where these things come from. So without any further ado, Lauren Pankratz. Yeah, that's good. And louder. So, um, I had this uh, vision last night. There was somebody out there. They were talking to their wife, and he said, uh, Honey, I'm going to go to Eugene uh, tomorrow. And, uh, okay, so you want to have to make me lunch. Well, that's good. What are you going to talk about down there? Some guy's going to talk about uh, why we think the Earth goes around the sun. Really? <laughs> they uh, can bring some guy in from NASA to explain it to you? Well, actually, that was supposed to be loud, so I thought. <laughs> 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 so, really, uh, uh, the Earth going around the sun uh, is a fairly strange concept because look up there. You don't see the Earth going around the sun. You see the sun going around the Earth. So why do we believe it? Uh, Jim Alcock used to ask his classes, prove to me that the Earth is round. How do you know the Earth is round? Well, we've taken... Uh, we, we believe other people. It's a belief system. It's, we don't have any evidence that the Earth is round or, or that the Earth goes around the sun. So how did we get this belief? Uh, and if you think about it, it, it's a pretty dramatic change in belief to think that we start out thinking that uh, this thing is kind of funny. I'm getting feedback. Is this, are no. we still doing okay out here? With yeah. The sun? Okay. So what? What is? What are? So we change belief from the idea that the sun is going around the Earth to the Earth going around the sun. Uh, that's a pretty big shift in belief. That's a huge shift in belief. What other shifts in belief can you think of that are you know have some other similarities like that? Yeah. Germ theory. Germ theory. Germ theory. Right. Absolutely. Big, big change in, in belief systems. Yeah. The major ideas. Right. Yeah. We believe that all I don't. I'm not hearing you. The belief system that. This is hands. Yeah. And sin, right, okay. Right? Yeah. We believe that progress is exponential and not cyclical. All right, okay. Which is to cause harm to your cattle and crops. Excellent, excellent, yeah, excellent. Witches. What else? Uh, the earth is round. Anything else? 
uh, Ray Hyman's exposition that uh, that uh, Eric Geller was inventing things by his mind. That was another major shift in <laughs> understanding of the world. And if you don't know that story, you've got to have somebody tell it to you because that is really a great story. <clears throat> so, uh, so let, let's start out in uh, 1543. We've got Copernicus, and he works on trying to understand, get the calendar straight because it's all messed up, and Easter is occurring in Christmas, and Copernicus is trying to solve this because the church has lost track of where Easter belongs. <clears throat> and he comes up with this crazy idea, works on it for his whole life practically, that the Earth might be going around the sun. <clears throat> he finally publishes it, and the story is that he got the final issue in his hand the day he died, which is, uh, you know, seems like it's got to be a falsehood, but, you know, a rumor or something, but apparently it's true. Um, but nobody really thinks much about it. I mean, few people kind of think about it, but not, not much is done. Nobody pays much attention to it. <clears throat> Until, of course, Galileo. Galileo, uh, then 16... 10, 16, 16 actually, he publishes this little pamphlet, Starry Message. And with his telescope, he finds that he looks at the moon and he sees that it's got all kinds of mountains on it, and it's rugged, and it looks like the Earth. Well, Aristotle said the moon was completely round, and the church fathers believed that it was a perfect globe. And even though it looks, you know, from our vision, it looks kind of craggy, nobody thought that. Everybody thought it was a perfect, perfect, perfect ball. <clears throat> and then he looks at uh, Jupiter and he sees the, uh, he sees moons going around it. Well, that's kind of strange because either the moon is going around the sun or the moon is going around the earth, but in any way, Jupiter is flying through the sky, and it's got moons going around it while it's flying around the sky. Now, that's not possible according to Aristotle, and Aristotle is practically a saint in the Christian church. So, Aristotle is in big trouble. <clears throat> then he looks, at, uh, he looks at the sun, and he sees sunspots. The sun is perfect shouldn't be any spots on that. So Aristotle, or uh, Galileo, <clears throat> is finally bringing some evidence, some evidence to the issue that the Earth is going around the sun. He also sees phases of the uh, uh, of planets, uh, Jupiter, I uh, mean, uh, Venus, uh, stars. Uh, stars, he said, what we see is only a tiny bit. Beyond it is a just a gigantic myriad of other stars that we're not seeing. Well, nothing should be added to the universe that we can't see. So he's now saying <clears throat> the, 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 the planets, the sun, the stars, uh, and the moon all contradict the Bible. Oops, that's not a career-enhancing thing to say. So, uh, so the problem here is that the church has the monopoly on telling us who, uh, how you should believe, what you should believe. And the church has the monopoly on this, and they don't like competition. Uh, they don't want a astronomer to be telling them how to interpret the Bible. <laughs> I mean, that's that's taking away their authority. So, it, in time, when, you know, as everybody knows, Galileo, you know, barely missed being tortured, and he barely missed being in prison, and he, you know, ran off to back up to. Uh, to the north, 
and uh, hid out and wrote some more books. But the idea that the uh, that this Earth would be going around the sun was basically banned. You can't talk about that. The professors at the University of Pisa and other universities in Italy, basically all those who, who supported Galileo, got thrown out. Nobody can talk about this. Nobody can deal with it. Nobody can, nobody can, talk, nobody can talk about that. Okay. Now, it's interesting. Um, that belief is controlled, not behavior. And I talk about this in my book some. I just laughed at this. The church is controlling your belief. And uh, in preparing this talk, I thought, you know something? We've come back to that in some ways. We've come back. Dude, it's not how you behave. It's not the good or the evil that you do. It's not the good or the bad or, you know, it's what you believe that kind of labels you. Um, I see some head shaking. Anybody want to kind of give an example? I mean, are we, uh, let, you know, I, I don't want to be political, but uh, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Say uh, more. <laughs> Yeah, another week. Yeah, we have to schedule another week. Yeah. 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 Well, it's it's fascinating to me. You know, the, the, part of the problem was that, the, at, at particularly the time of Galileo, right before, the, the Vatican was in a terrible mess. It was even uh, called the Lie Factory, interestingly enough. The, the, uh, basically, the Romans looked out up to Vatican there and called it the Lie Factory. I mean, it was a mess. It was uh, the, the uh, folks in the Outer Lands basically said that uh, Rome was a sewer, uh, a, a moral sewer. So it was hard to go after people for their behavior because they <laughs> themselves were in such a mess. So they were basically controlling what you thought. And so nobody believed that the nobody knew that the Earth is going around the sun. So how do we get there? Well, it turns out a guy by the name of Bernard Fontenelle, a name you probably never even heard of, unless you read my book, which is back then for sale at a big discount. Dedicated dedicated to Ray Hyman. So, you get an autograph too, right? So you can have an autograph. If you don't get a copy, you'll be insulting Ray Hyman. <laughs> you wouldn't want to do that. Bernard Fontenelle uh, he was 29 years old. He was a playwright and philosopher. The ladies loved him. He was always popular at his parties. <clears throat> but he was a deeply religious guy. But he said, the church is effed up. <laughs> and they're destroying themselves. And I don't like that because this is my religion. And he said, they don't want to talk about things that are important. They don't want to talk about science. And the world is going towards science. And they're going to be left behind. And it's going to be big trouble. The church is going to be basically useless if we don't change it. i got to do something about it. <clears throat> he wasn't a very confront, uh, he wasn't into confrontation. So he thought of some ways of figuring out uh, how to, how to approach this. And so he wrote a dialogue, and uh, it was um, uh, the title was uh, basically about um, plurality, uh, discussions of plurality. Now, plurality I mean, is a pretty dumb title for a book, but plurality referred to the possibility that there were other planets where other people existed. 
Now, that's not a good idea either because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because, you know, there's only humans. God only created humans and the earth. So you don't want to go there. So, so Bernard had a difficult time. So how can I write about the fact that science is the future without getting myself into trouble? Like Bruno, who in 1600, as you may know, got himself burned at the stake. And uh, he promoted the idea of plurality. So here is Bernard Fontenelle jumping right into that fire. Right into that fire. Now, Bruno didn't get burned because of necessarily his belief in, in plurality, but he believed that the universe was infinite. There were all sorts of planets out there. Uh, the sky was filled with other possibilities. And he thought, praise God, he was, uh, he was a priest. He said, Praise God! It's a, the whole the whole world, the whole universe should praise God, and there are other planets where they're praising God. Church didn't like that idea, and other things as well. But he refused to change his belief to confirm with the belief of the church. Again, an issue he refused to conform his belief. <clears throat> So, uh, Fontenelle wrote a dialogue of two people, a, a scientist, a philosopher, a, uh, a philosopher, a scientist, and a woman of status, a marquise. And these two, this woman of status, had this magnificent uh, palace and a big garden. And the two of them went out into the garden at night, and the tension, of the, the, the romantic tension <laughs> begins. There are these two people walking out, and he says, look at the sky, how beautiful it is, and why lovers write their poems to, this, to the night. This is night so wonderful. And she says, yes, and you know, the, 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 the tension between them is just, <laughs> they just see that. <clears throat> and he looks up and he says, I see out there, there might be planets, and they're filled with living people. One of ten things you shouldn't say on a first date. <laughs> Where in the world is this going? <laughs> So, so the, uh, the, the, and, and, and she says, you know, why do you think that? I've only known of crazy people who think that. Uh, and anyway, so I haven't got all this memorized, so let me uh, pull out my notes. The first night, um, they talk about the mysteries of the universe, and she becomes curious. I'd like to know, what do you know about the universe? What do you know about what's up there? And so he begins to explain. He says, well, first of all, philosophy, philosophers have two things. They have bad eyesight, and they're curious. Bad eyesight, they can't see what's going on. They want to know, they're curious about what's happening. He says, it's like, you go, to, you go to the opera, and you see the sets moving up and down and things like that. Behind the scenes, there are all these wires and pulleys and guys and pulling things around and moving things around. And you see this perfectly beautiful play in, in front of you. It's unfolding, and you don't know what's behind there. So the same is true of the universe. We don't know what's happening. Why is this being pulled around? Why are things moving around up there? What's happening? We are curious. And now we have telescopes. And now we can see things that we didn't see before. So um, he said, Copernicus 
did an interesting thing. He switched the moon, he switched the earth and the sun. So now instead of the earth going around the, uh, the sun going around the earth, we have the earth going around the sun. And she says, well, I don't feel anything. I don't, I don't, it doesn't seem like that. And he explains, well, if you get on a boat, you, and you're on a boat, and you go to sleep at night, you, you're in exactly the same position you were in the morning as when you went to bed. The boat is moved along, but you don't know it. It's, you're not aware of the boat's moving along. Only when you look out at the at the at the riverbank, you can see that you've you've moved along. And we're the same way. It's kind of like an optical illusion. He explains it to her, and she's fascinated. And they discuss this, um, and she says, "Well, it seems like the Earth would have to go an enormous distance. How can it do that?" He says. I don't know, but think of it the other way around. How could the sun go so how could the sun go so far? How could the sun go so fast? That doesn't make sense either. But it's one of the two. It's gotta be one of the two. And it seems like it's uh, more likely that the earth is moving. In fact, that's what our that's what our telescopes are showing us. And moreover, uh, he says, when I look out at the stars, he says, every star could be a world. And that's the end of the first night. So the second night, she comes back and she says, I'm good. Uh, he said, you want me to review kind of what we said last night? She says, I'm good. Let's move on. I, this is great. I love this. And there's still this the romantic tension between them. I can hardly do justice to this book because it's so fascinating. And he says, um, the moon, like the earth, is inhabited. <laughs> and she says, he says, uh, in fact, uh, he explains eclipses and he talks about uh, the relationship too, but he comes back to the idea that, that, that the moon is inhabited. He says, what happens? Uh, you know, they may be like the Indians in America that are far away. We don't know much about them. They have a different culture. They have a different style. There are different kinds of people. But those people on the moon, they are up there, and, and, and they may be wondering about us here on the Earth. So he does this role reversal. And he says, maybe someday, They'll come down here, or maybe someday we will fly up there, and then we will know. And well, that's the end of the second night. The third night, she says, I've accepted the idea that there are people up there on the moon. And he said, actually, there probably aren't people on the moon. <laughs> I just accepted the idea, and now you're throwing it out. Well, he says to her, uh, there are no clouds, it doesn't seem like there's any water, uh, uh, no storms, rainbow, so it doesn't seem, maybe, you know, it's unlikely that people could really live up there. There's no water, storms, and so on. And then he says to her, never give more than half of your mind to this sort of belief. Never give more than half of your mind to this sort of belief. Sense. Keep the other half open so that the contrary can be admitted if necessary. Is that good? That's a good one, yeah, yeah. Is that good? Is that good? And she's catching on. She's very bright. She interacts with him. She asks questions. She's involved. She's toe to toe. Now you have to remember uh, when uh, Fontenelle was writing this, women were of very low status. Uh, women were not considered intellectually uh, 
of equals. He treats her as an equal. He treats her right. And in fact, one can see him at these parties that he's going to. These very popular parties. Now you start to know why this guy's poor. He's he 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 treats women right. He treats women right, and he's got them. Uh, uh, he's he's got this uh, he's got this 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 dialogue going really well. Um, he says, uh, but he said, there, there could be life, but it would be entirely different. Uh, he said, then what we know, as a matter of fact, he says, if you take a look at a microscope, you can see life that we can't see by the naked eye. So down there, below there, there's all this life going on. There's all of this life. It could be like that up on the moon or up on other planets. He says, uh, it, uh, it, it's, it could be very, very different up there. And that's the end of the third night. The fourth night, they discuss planets uh, and the possibility there are moons going uh, on these planets. They talk about Jupiter. And from Jupiter, the Earth will look very small, very tiny. And the, the astronomers on Jupiter are looking down and saying, well, there can't be any life on that little tiny thing down there. That can't be life down there. Uh, but, he says, uh, Jupiter's so big, they're probably, they may still be exploring, they may still be exploring their own, their own land that's so large. Uh, Jupiter's so huge, they may still be trying to figure out what they're just on their own planet. Uh, but the idea here is that they're looking at, they're, they're role reversing again, they're looking at the possibilities of what life would be like, and the astronomers on, on Jupiter are looking down and saying, well, there can't be life down there. And we're looking up at Jupiter and saying, well, it can't be life up there. But there may be, there may be, we don't know. Fifth evening. Then he talks about the stars. And the stars, uh, the stars are sh go so far out there that we can see with our telescope. It's it's just a new world. And he said, we know that those stars are actually suns. They're not reflected lights like our planets, because um, uh, they're so far away. It couldn't reflect that light back. They're bright. They're, dude, those are stars. The stars are really just suns. If the stars are suns, the stars could have planets. Now, you have to think, this is, this really is mind-boggling to think about this. And those planets, they could have life on them like we have here. And, and they kind of go th together through this existential crisis. And you know, I, I suspect all of us have you know, thought about this. How in the world are we alive on this tiny little thing in this gigantic universe, and yet we can look out and make sense of it? I mean, it it's just overwhelming. I'm sure all of you experience that. Uh, uh, and, and here, Fontanelle is dealing with those existential crises, and she feels. She says, "I feel lost. I feel lost." And those are exactly the words that Fontanelle experienced himself and went into a depression and said, "I've got to change this." this is, I just and he came to the idea, like Bruno, that well, let's say the whole world is still. Let's just open up, the, open the world up. Let's just open the universe up, and let's just. Be glad that we're a part of this huge. Um, and he, he t they talk about the, the, the telescopes now are revealing this new reality. Um, and uh, and and she comes to some she comes to some uh, agreement with them that she can perhaps celebrate the idea of a larger universe. And. Uh, and he says to her, uh, uh, 
Uh, whenever you look at the stars, think of me. And she says, uh, I will. Uh, it, it's romantic ending. Whenever you look at the stars, think of me. But before he said that, he says to her as they are parting, you decide what to believe. You decide what to believe. Now, you can't even imagine how enormously controversial that idea is at the time. You decide what to believe. The church has always been telling you what to believe. Other people are always telling you what to believe. And he's telling this insignificant woman, you decide what to believe. The next morning, she went out running, and her t-shirt said, just do it. <laughs> So, um, I had another good line in there, which I forgot already. Sorry. Now, Fontenelle, he could have, he could have addressed the whole issue of science by talking about how Galileo rolled balls in an inclined plane and created laws, and it was worked out with a formula. Could predict where a ball would be at a given time, and you know all that. Drop the ball from a tower. Could have talked about uh, telescopes, but instead he talked about a man and a woman in a garden, and they talked about the sky. He never mentioned God. He never mentioned. Uh, he never mentioned. Uh, uh, Anything on the outside, he never mentioned the scriptures, he never mentioned how you should believe. He just had two people talking about what the world, what the universe might be like. And that's tough to censor. <laughs> and uh, I, I was going to check this out before I got up here, but I forgot. I think his book was. Banned, but in fact, his book was the bestseller for decades. Hmm. It sold in every single country. It was translated in every single European country. It sold like hotcakes in France. It was the seller. And when Fontenelle died at 99 years old plus 11 months, all of Paris close it down and celebrate his birthday. I can do that for you too, right? <laughs> because Fontenelle just opened up the idea that you can make up your mind what you want to believe. And if that's not a major turning point in the history of mankind, I don't know what is. I mean, it is just an amazing, uh, an amazing concept that you can decide what to believe. And he, he's already given her the tools of science to, to know what we can trust, what we see because we have these new instruments. We can trust what we see because of the, the science that we're developing. We can look and find convergent uh, Convergent uh, uh, information. Uh, what do you call it? Convergent statistic. What is it? Convergent validity. That's what I'm looking for. I, I, I went to college and learned that term. Con there's convergent information that supports this idea, and now you can believe it. If you don't have all the information, just give it half your mind. So, uh, so, uh, I, 
I wish we could do lots of discussion here about what, 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 uh, what, 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 where this could, what this could mean for today. I mean, what, what, I mean, maybe we need a new paradigm. Maybe we need a new paradigm for, uh, for skeptics to, to communicate. You know, you know, again, it's interesting, I was thinking, I know that you're going to talk about that we don't, you know, lots of people dying, that's no big deal. The individual dies, that's a big deal. And I think the dialogue seems to me, you know, the dialogue does that for us in this case. I mean, he, he, he brings this to such a, a personal level, he brings it down to such a personal level, and then communicates that, and the people just couldn't get enough of it. The people just couldn't get enough of it. And since that time, we now believe that the Earth goes around the sun. You can know when you look up. It doesn't seem like it. Thanks for